Welcome to Light Church Online. Thank you for joining us for today's message. Father, we thank you for the word today. We need it as we need the air that we breathe. We need wisdom. So teach us to apply your wisdom to our lives. In Jesus' name. Call your attention to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. We're talking about authority and power. We've been talking about it for a little while now. And so what I believe the Lord wanted us to do after we talked about it was to look at it and how it operates in the lives of men and women in scriptures. And when I uh, began to apply myself to be a student of the word and looked at the life of Jesus, it seemed to me that every single day that Jesus lived, there was a new adventure. I mean, if he wasn't walking water, he was multiplying fish and loaves. If he wasn't multiplying fish and loaves, he was raising the dead. If he wasn't raising the dead, he was healing the sick. If he wasn't healing the sick, then he was teaching in the synagogue. And so I looked at that life, or what I thought was a good picture of his life. And I thought, well, that's the way my life ought to be. There should be an adventure every single day. So when that wasn't happening, I thought there's got to be something wrong. Maybe I'm not the, the Christian that I profess to be. Because every day there wasn't a new adventure. It actually seemed kind of lackluster when I measured it in light of those thoughts. But then as I, I studied more and began to uh, look at how scripture is put together, uh, I learned that the scripture is not put together day after day after day. So when you look at the life of Jesus, for example, a lot of times we have a tendency to think that every single day is chronicled in scripture. And much to my surprise, that's not the way it is. You know, there are some chapters that if you read it, it almost seems like he said this, this day, and this, that day, and this, that day. But a closer look reveals that chapters are not necessarily divided according to hours and days and months. There's one chapter, in fact, there's several chapters in the book of St. John, for example, that's actually one long conversation that Jesus had. And so the truth was and still is that we're not given a day-by-day -day account of Jesus' life. I mean, many he spent three years in ministry and before that, 30 years just growing up. And it's like that when we read episodes in the Old Testament concerning uh, the patrons, the saints who God worked with. It's not like every single day there was a crisis. Every single day there seemed to be a dynamic miracle. Every single day it was a thrill a minute. Because the truth is that's not the way life is lived. The Bible says we walk by faith. Okay, it's not a run. Okay, it's not a hop. It's a, it's a walk. That means you have to step it off one step at a time, one day at a time. And so most of the things that happen to us in our lives seem really ordinary. 
And so we have a tendency to interpret that as though God somehow or another is using somebody else and not using us. We look at the saints that uh, we are given record of the miraculous happening in their lives. And we think, well, what about me? Where is the miraculous in my life? That's because we fail to properly assess the authority and the power that God has commissioned us to walk in. So while we may, as human beings and, and those that sometimes can be starstruck and thrill seekers, we may overlook the very power of God that's operating in our lives every single day. You know, we, we, we applaud and we put on, on TV and in headlines. You know, a mother who, who picks up a vehicle that has fallen on her child. And we think, oh, what a great, great illustration of God's power coming on a woman to save her child. And so we get all excited about that. But what about the woman that every single day gets up, gets children off to school, goes to work herself, sometimes two jobs, day in and day out. And at the end of a certain period of time, the child graduates from high school. What about that being a manifestation of the power of God? Because the truth is, that's how life is lived out day by day. And so there are times when I'm sure the miracles of God show up in our lives, but we could easily overlook them looking for the dynamic, the thrill, the theatrical. When in actuality, if he touched you this morning <laughs> and you opened your eyes and you wasn't crippled or crazy, that's a testimony to the power of God that's operating in your life. If when you got up and you knew that you didn't have the money that you needed for that day at that time, and yet you proceeded on through the day as though God had already met the need without worrying about where the money was going to come from. It wasn't miraculous. Sometimes God moved through strange and mysterious means that you may not have even been aware of, but at the end of the day, the need was met. That's still a demonstration of the authority and the power that we are called to live out. And so here is a man that is part of the lineage of Christ, one of the patriarchs, if you please. We've heard of Abraham, Father Abraham, the father of the faith, the one that God cut a covenant with, and he left his father's house he left his his hometown he left his familiar surroundings headed to a place that God said I will show you not knowing exactly where that was but he trusted God he believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness the Bible says we've heard of him right We've heard the story of Abram and Sarah and how Sarah could not bear any children of her own and yet God promised her and Abraham that they would bear a son that would be the son of promise, the son that God would fulfill his promise to Abraham through. And his name is Isaac. So we've heard of Abraham. We probably have heard more about Jacob, Isaac's son. Because he tricked his father with the help of his wife to get the blessing that was supposed to be conferred on his older brother Esau. And because of that, he had to leave home and they sent him to live with his uncle. 
And while there at his uncle's house, he prospered and he left there and on his way back to his own hometown, he has an encounter with an angel. We sung songs about Jacob's ladder. Perhaps you've heard that song. Don't ask me to sing it because I don't remember it. But we probably heard more about Jacob. Because Jacob is the father of 12. Jacob's name would be changed to Israel. So that everybody louds Jacob as somebody who had, who had undergone a transition, a transformation, a change of nature. Once a trickster and a con man in and of himself. And yet he has transitioned from being a con man to being a man that would, that would father 12 sons that would become the 12 tribes of Israel. A lot is referred to when we talk of Jacob. But Isaac is not so. Because Isaac is, is I dare say, he's probably like you and me. Not a whole lot of thrills and, and theatrics to his life. If I could put it this way, Isaac lived a drama-free life. And of course, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine not long ago, and I was, we, we were at a function, and I said, uh, you know, so-and-so, I was surprised that they were not here, talking about some of the local politicians. And, and so this person that, that I was talking to, who was pretty prominent, said, well, you know, we like drama, so there wasn't no drama going on, so they didn't show up. <laughs> what is it about us that we cannot satisfy that insatiable desire for drama so much so that reality TV just keeps on perpetuating itself because you do realize that's what reality TV is right oh y'all don't watch none of that Y'all funny, boy. Nobody, y'all didn't say that, and y'all didn't say that. Y'all just sit there like, <laughs> just don't look in my direction. <laughs> All right? But that's what, that's what reality TV is. It's drama. Isaac lived a relatively drama-free life. He's a man that always obeyed his parents. He was so trusting of his father that at one time when God told his father Abraham to lay Isaac on the altar and to kill him as a sacrifice, Isaac goes with his father up to that mountain to sacrifice what he thinks is a lamb. He notices there's no lamb, but he's just trusting his father. He gets to the mountain and they build the altar and they put the wood on the altar Isaac looks around and says dad I see the altar I see the wood but where is the sacrifice and Abraham said God will provide and so because he trusted his father his father now lays him on the altar. A, uh, there's no record that Isaac struggled or Isaac said, hold up. Wait a minute, old man. I mean, you know, I know you old, but I think we're taking this a little bit too far. No record of that. Isaac was just that kind of an individual. Just obeyed his parents. And so, you know, when it came to Trusting his father and his mother, he trusted them. And what they taught him about God's covenant, he lived it out. He grows up. We don't really have any other uh, episodes recorded of his life beside uh, 
The fact that his, his I guess we would say his stepbrother, Ishmael, who was born by his mother's maid and his father. We, that's what we call him, right? Y'all help me out. Is that what we call him or not? I sit there acting like y'all don't know. So Ishmael makes fun of him when he's just a little, little kid. And eventually God tells Abraham, send that woman and her son out of your house. And so Isaac grows up basically as an only child. Protected by his mom. Taught by his father. And so at age 40, he's still living with him. Today, that might be frowned upon. Somebody say, not Mike Pastor, eh? <laughs> not, but but that's, that was the culture then. Okay? You didn't necessarily leave your parents' house just because you grew up. So he lived with his father and his mother, learned the terms of the covenant, learned the covenant. At age 40, it's his father and mother that selects the wife that he's to marry. Try that on for size. I don't know, I'm just kind of led to look over here. Because <laughs> I know a lot of you don't want your parents selecting not just who you marry, but who you date, who you go out with. But the problem with that is, if you got a godly mother and father, why wouldn't you trust them to select for you someone that is appropriate for you to marry? I mean, don't you think that they would want for you the very best? Especially if they're following the leading of God. And often we get in trouble because we're not following God's leading. We're following the leading of our flesh. Somebody told me, I won't call no names, but they told me I said something about Flavor Flav at the nine o'clock service. I have to go back and listen to the message to really verify that. I said that? Okay. No disrespect intended to flavor flav. But if I'm being honest, I'm not picking flavor flav for my daughter. He might be a good brother, but some about the way the children might come out looking <laughs> that I'm concerned about. <laughs> you know, because I got to present my grandchildren. You know, this is my grandchild. And see, I know y'all, boy. I know y'all. Y'all be kind to Pastor. Oh, Pastor. And then as soon as you leave, my God. Yeah, church, we need to pray. <laughs> okay, let me get back on to this. Message. Okay, so, so Abram and Sarah picked out Rebecca for their son Isaac, who's 40 years old. And they did a good job. Because of their relationship with God, they send their servant back to their homeland and give him instructions about what kind of woman would be suitable for their son Isaac. He was such an obedient son that he didn't, he didn't buck against that. We never have record of uh, Isaac saying, well, how come I can't pick my own woman? I'm the one who got to live with him. Why y'all got, I mean, I'm grown. Now we do have record of Isaac's son doing that. Esau 
who forfeited his birthright. And the Bible says Esau married some different kind of women. It displeased his mother, Rebecca, because, you know, he liked this kind of woman and they knew, son, she ain't the one. But not Isaac. Isaac was not that kind. Very humble, submissive. And so because of that, God blessed this man with a woman that was so beautiful. You know, a woman got to be fine if you got to lie about being married to her. Because <laughs> you're scared that they're going to kill you to get to her. Right? But she was. Just like his father Abraham had done with Sarah, he did with Rebecca when he, he found himself in a position to where he thought his life might be on the line if they found out that Rebecca was his wife because she was so beautiful. Just like his father had thought about those that were outside the covenant, he thought that the way these people think, if they want her, they won't just take her from me. They will kill me and then take her. But that notwithstanding, that's really the only record we have of a mistake that Isaac made. Wow. And so, and so he finds himself in a place where the Bible says there is a famine. Genesis chapter 26. There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord then appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Now, it was customary because Egypt was such a powerful nation at the time. A nation where if things were hard... If you got to Egypt, you could somehow or another maneuver and manipulate and transact business in a way that you could ride out whatever the economic conditions may be if you didn't get killed. Abraham went to Egypt when a famine hit during the time he was alive. And it was in Egypt, the Bible says, that Abraham became very rich. So, in people's mind, then, Egypt is where you want to go. Yeah, yeah, y'all understand how that goes, right? You know, the way you people from Mississippi came to Dallas. <laughs> y'all know I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. I meant to say Arkansas. But anyway, <laughs> I know y'all went back and said, we have found the promised land. <laughs> I like Mississippi though, really. I just don't spend the night there. All right. So, <laughs> if you got to Egypt, you probably could make it through the famine. The Lord tells him, don't go. Stay right where you are. Now, you got to understand, it was a famine. Naturally thinking, if it's a famine, that means no water, which means no food, no crops. What else? No what? Somebody say no showers. No, you ain't taking no showers. <laughs> what else? Livestock probably thins out. And God tells this man, stay right where you are. Is God not aware of the conditions of the land? Does he not know there is a famine there? Why would God tell this man to stay where he was in spite of how hard things were for everybody? But you got to understand, Isaac grew up. In a household where his father and mother taught him who God was. 
and how profitable it was that you trust him no matter what you see around you. Isaac learned that God who makes a covenant keeps his covenant. And so it's in the midst of a famine that God reminds this man of his word to his father. Wow, what a God we serve. Because in the midst of the famine, he tells Isaac, I promised your daddy that I was going to make a great nation out of him and his seed. So even though I know times are hard right where you are, stay right there. Somebody say, stay right there. Stay right there because right yeah, right I'm going to bless you. Well, Lord, it don't look like nobody in the land is being blessed. Stay right there. Ain't nobody hiring here. Stay right there. The company seems to be going down. Stay right there. Things don't seem to be working out. Stay right there. You see, you are a man of the covenant. And when you are a man of the covenant or a woman of the covenant, if you know your covenant, I said last night, one of the reasons Christians are destroyed is because they don't know the terms of the covenant. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed because they do not know. And if you don't know the terms of the covenant, it's a little hard to appropriate them. Right? How many of y'all got insurance policies? Some of y'all. All right. You got beneficiaries, right? Right? Well, if your beneficiaries don't know the terms of that policy once you die, it's not likely, unless somebody tells them, it's not likely that they're going to benefit. If you don't know that somebody died and left you their house, you could spend your life outdoors as a vagabond because you don't know that you are a beneficiary of a contract, a covenant. Well, it's that way with Christians. When you don't know what Jesus died and left you, you spend your life as a vagabond trying to make ends meet when he's already covered not just the ends but the middle also. So he tells Isaac, stay right where you are. And he reminds Isaac of the covenant that he made with Abraham. Isaac, without putting up any resistance, does just what he says. And let's look at what happens. He says in verse 3, dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. Dwell in what land? You mean the land of the famine? Oh yeah. Dwell means to live. In other words, even though things are hard for everybody, you live here. Now, let me, let me, just, let me just drop this helpful hint to you who are listening on. A lot of times we think only of ourselves. But again, when you're ignorant of the covenant... That's how you think. I got to look out for myself. No, the covenant I got says God provides for me. But it also says, you remember what he said Abraham, to Abraham? In you, I'm going to bless everybody else. So while you busy just thinking about your position and your job, God's thinking about everybody else. And while you may think it's uncomfortable for you right where you are, God's trying to get somebody else blessed. He's trying to preserve somebody else. So what would happen if you, who are supposed to be a vessel that God uses, an instrument of his blessing, leave that job just because you think it's uncomfortable? What about all the rest of the employees there that God's interested in preserving? And while you complaining about you not getting paid right and about the hours you got to work, God's looking way past that because there are other people that he's trying to save. But if you're not aware of your covenant, 
You don't see that far. And so God says to Isaac, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your descendants. I'm going to give all these lands to your descendants and I'm going to do what I swore to your father, Abraham, I'm going to do. Now, when you look at verse 6, it says, so Isaac did what? He did what? He stayed. He lived. He dwelt right there in Gerar. Why did he do that? Even though it was hard times in Gerar, why did he do that? Because God said so. In fact, in the previous verse, God said, I'm, I'm going to bless Abraham because he obeyed my voice. I'm going to bless Abraham because he kept my charge. I'm going to bless your father because he kept my commandments. He kept my statutes. He kept my laws. So I'm going to bless you because of his obedience. Parents, you ought to listen up right here. A lot of times our children are cut short because of our disobedience. A lot of times our children are neglected because we didn't obey what God said. Because we got it on good authority that God said, I'm not just trying to bless you. I'm not just trying to bless your children. I'm trying to bless your children's children. So when you are tempted to disobey, you probably ought to think about those that are coming after you and what price they may have to pay because of your disobedience. Here, Isaac is told by God, I'm going to keep you in this land of famine. I'm going to bless you because of the faithfulness of your father. And what happens? What happens? You drop down to verse 12. Then Isaac sold in that land. He did what? He sold. You know what sowing means? What does it mean? He planted. Translation, he worked. I said he worked. Y'all didn't hear me. I said he worked. I said he worked. You know when he worked? You know when he worked? Huh? Every day. He didn't use the famine as an excuse. Ain't nobody else making nothing. Ain't nobody else's stuff growing. I think I'll just stay here and pray. And believe God. Well, we know that kind of a thinking doesn't work. And so James would write and tell us of the New Testament. Faith without works, it don't produce nothing. All right? So Isaac worked. You want the blessing of God? You better find something to work on. Sitting at home praying, trusting him, and believing God is not an indication that you are actually believing God. Because when you believe God, you follow his instructions. And his instructions are you got to put your hands to something. A lot of people are sitting back waiting on a check to come in the mail. Waiting on some kind of lotto. I just had to say it, didn't I? Some kind of sweepstakes. But I read a piece the other day of the horrors of those that won lottos. And I said earlier, I used to pray that God would let me win the publisher's clearing house. Until I found out about what happened to those that fell into such windfalls. The horror stories that came, which they don't tell you about. All right, and so, and so God does us a favor, I think, if he has anything to do with a lotto, which is not likely, but if he did, it would be to prevent us. Y'all look at, listen at him, get quiet. Listen at him, get quiet. Listen at him, get quiet. Pastor, I just prayed last night. For last night's lotto. I just pray. You telling me that God, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. He did you a favor if he was involved in it and keeping you out of it. All right? And so, I mean, look at what happens to our super athletes that go from nothing to millions of dollars in just a day's time. 
Look at the horror stories that we have heard. And the truth is that the majority of all our athletes that for a short period of time, what's the average lifespan of an athlete? Three years, something like that? 3.4 years in the NFL. All the money that was given to them. And yet the majority of them in the broke and destitute, often sick, and eventually on the street. Here's a man that God said, I'm going to bless you. So what does he do? He stays where God tells him. He gets up every day and he goes to work. That's what he does. I know that don't sound like a thrilling testimony to you. Because you, you, want, you want one of them kind of testimonies where I paid my tithe Sunday and Monday I got a check in the mail. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You seen them commercials on TV? Just get the water. Oh, I got the water. And I tell you, the water. I put the water on my pocketbook. And just, uh, before the week was out, I got a check in the mail for 35000 Come on now. Isaac is who we are compared to in the book of Galatians. He sold. He went to work every single day trusting God that he would honor the covenant that he made with his father. You ready for this? We still in verse 12. And Isaac reaped in the same year what? A hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. Wait a minute. He reaped in the same year a hundredfold and let me go over that again with you. Let's start from the first of it. He sowed in that land. That's work, right? I mean, sowing is work even when it ain't a famine. But now no rain has fallen, and so now you really got to plow in some dry ground. But he sowed anyway, because God told him, stay right where you are. Well, what was he before the famine? Anybody know? He was a farmer. He didn't change occupations. He was a farmer before the famine. So God didn't change what he did after the famine. You missed it. But I'm believing you'll get it. No, what God tells him, trust me. You just honor me like your father did. And we know his father was a tither. <laughs> we know his father was a giver. We know his father used the blessing that God had given him to bless others. So he had been taught to tithe. And I hadn't even, this ain't even a tither's message. But it just came up. So what do you think Isaac did? He tithed. And based on, I mean, you can hear it if you are at our offertory period every time we confess. The blessing of the tither is that God would open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. So that's abundance, right? And what else? He will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And what else? He'll do what? He'll bless the work of your hands. And what else? 
See, don't miss that other part. He not only says, I bless the work of your hands, he also says, I bless your workplace. So here is Isaac in a land of famine. Nobody's stuff is growing, but he's working because he's a man of the covenant. He's been taught to trust the God of the covenant. And look at what happens. God blesses the work of his hands. In the same year, he does what? He reaps a hundredfold. But that's not all. It says, and. What? The Lord blessed him. Well, let's read on to see what that was like. Verse 13. The man began to prosper. It was in the land of famine. And he continued prospering. That was in the land of famine. Until he became very prosperous. That was in the land of famine. Nobody else's stuff growing. Nobody else's stuff working. But his is producing. That was in the land of famine. Verse 14. He had possessions of flocks in the land of famine. Possessions of herds in the land of famine. A great number of servants in the land of famine. Are you getting this picture? And God blessed him so that, look at what his enemies thought about him. So the Philistines, come on, envied him. Don't you think that was a witness of God? Wait a minute. Why is this man's stuff growing and I can't get nothing to grow? Why is this man's herd growing and my herds are depleted? Why is this man's possessions increasing when my stuff is decreasing? And so they envied him. Let me hurry on, as they say, to my clothes. Well, they got so envious of him that they asked him to leave. Now, I got to tell you that as a man and a woman of the covenant operating in the authority and power of God, don't you expect for everybody to welcome your prosperity when God proves that he's with you. You're going to have some haters, but you can't be a hater. Just because they hate on you, you got to remember that the object of the covenant is for everybody to be blessed, even those that hate you. So even though they're envious of your prosperity, God may require you to share your prosperity to keep them from dying off. And so what happens? Well, the man started digging water wells. Why would you dig water wells in a famine? You dig water wells because you are a man of the covenant. Are you listening to me? So everything you touch, the work of your hands, come on somebody, the work of your hands is blessed. Even in a famine, if you dig a well, because you are a man or a woman of the covenant. Going to be some water in that well. And what would happen when he built or when he dug the well? The Philistines would come and say, that's our water. And you know what? He said, cool, you take it. But he's a man of the covenant. And guess what he did next? He dug another well. You know why he dug another well? Because he's a man of the covenant. And he knows, even in a famine, if I dig a water well, got to be some water down there. So he would dig another well, and guess what they would find? They found some more water. And the Philistines would come and say, that's our water. And you know what he said? Cool, you take it. And so the man kept digging wells in a time of famine. And every well he dug, guess what he found? He found water in the well. Why did he find water in the well? Because he's a man of the covenant. He walks in authority and power. And God blessed the work of his hands. And so because he was such an humble man and he had been kicked out of the community of Gerard, God prospered him wherever he went and whatever he did, God's blessing was on him. Let me tell you something. If you're going to walk in authority and power, you got to stay humble before the Lord. Again, you can't be a hater of those that hate you. 
Because God's not only trying to preserve you, he's also trying to preserve them. Didn't Jesus say God makes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust? And so while I'm busy digging wells, I'm not worried about those who claim a stake in the water of my well. I realize that the reason he blesses me is because he wants somebody else blessed. And so I'm not going to complain that they're making it hard on me. Because you can't make it hard on a man of the covenant. It can't be too difficult for a man of the covenant. Every place I put my foot down, he said I'm going to bless. If you put your foot down on a rock, he can make water come out of a rock. If you put your foot down in the desert, he can rain down quail so that everybody has enough to eat. If you're in a land of famine, don't complain or criticize. Just believe the God who made covenant with Abraham. But I got something else for you. Not only did he make a covenant with Abraham, he made a covenant with Jesus. And he promised Jesus, everyone that accepts you as their substitute, not only will I save them, I'll heal them, I'll deliver them, I'll treat them just like I treated you, I'll raise them from the dead, I'll make them righteous, I'll make them holy, I'll be with them just like I am with you. I'm a man under authority and a man in authority. And so I don't care where God puts me. I don't care where God says, this is where I want you to stay. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm just going to remember he made a covenant with Jesus. And he said, Whoever calls on your name, I'll deliver. So, you got to change the way you think, huh? You got to change what you say, huh? You got to change your disposition, huh? That's why on Wednesday nights, I'll say it again, you can skip these Wednesday night uh, sessions if you want to, and you will regret it. Because we're talking about walking in forgiveness, and how your unforgiveness is not hurting the person that you are walking around offended by. It's hurting you. We're also talking about most of the time people who think they are the offended are actually the offender. You think you've been wrong. No. You better take another look at that thing. You're the one that did the wrong. But Satan has deceived you into thinking you were wronged. So instead of you going saying, I forgive you, you need to go say, forgive me. When you are a man or a woman of the covenant, you walk by a different set of rules. Now, if you want to be treated like the world, just live like the world. Talk like the world. Handle your business like the world handles their business. But if you want to be treated like a man or woman of the covenant, you got to change how you think, how you talk, how you live, how you treat people. Isaac, you don't see his name up in lights. 
He's not one of the most popular personalities of the scriptures. People don't usually preach and teach about Isaac. Because there was not drama in Isaac's life. He just honored his parents. Trusted the God who made covenant with his father. Went to work every day. And God was with him. That's the way life is. You just get up and go to work as a man or woman of the covenant. Do the job that you said you were going to do. Stop complaining and act like you trust the God who made covenant with Jesus. Okay, so they want you to work long hours. And you don't think you're getting paid what you ought to be getting paid. But if you're going to operate by the covenant, you can't think like that. Because they are never supposed to be your source. You're supposed to be trusting God, not trusting them. And so, like Isaac, we probably never will see your name on the headlines. We probably will never see you on TV for doing something spectacular. But just live like a man or woman of the covenant. And God who said, though your beginning is small, yet shall your end increase greatly. Stand with me. Life is a race, but you don't have to run it alone. Take advantage of your help. Receive Jesus today, and he will help you with everything you're going through. God has a plan for you. The first step in that plan is salvation. Read Romans 10 and 9 and pray this prayer of salvation. God in heaven, I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I call on you now for my eternal salvation. I receive forgiveness for all my sin. I accept your unconditional love. Thank you for receiving me. I submit myself to you. With you as my helper, I will live according to your plan the rest of my life. Amen. If you are blessed by today's message, we encourage you to give an offering. Simply click the Give Online link on the Light Church homepage. Thank you for tuning in this week. We look forward to you joining us during our next broadcast. Have a blessed week.